Some years ago, Stephanie's sibling, Lisa, was studying abroad in Granada, Spain, and we went with some friends to visit them. During our stay, Lisa introduced us to a local friend they had met during their stay there, whose name was Fernando. Uh, we spent a lot of time with Fernando. He's a really great guy, but one of the things I remember most about him is that we were hanging out with him one day, and we asked him to tell us a joke in Spanish, because um, that's a really important way of communicating culture is, you know, what kind of jokes do people tell? We were curious to see if a Spanish joke would still be funny in English. So he thought about it for a bit and he shared this one with us. It turns out in Spain they also tell blonde jokes, <laughs> just like in the U.S. I'm not really a fan of blonde jokes and apologies to any of our lighter haired friends here, but I wanted to share this one and just bear with me, you'll see why. So roughly translated, it goes like this. There's this blonde on a game show for blondes with an audience full of blondes. The contestant has made it to the $64,000 question and is about to win the game. And the host asks her the final question. Is a rose A, an animal, B, a mineral, or C, a vegetable? The contestant thinks for a moment and she answers, A. Well, the audience, knowing that she's gotten it wrong and pulling for her to win, start chanting to the host, Otro oportunidad, otro oportunidad. It means give her another chance, right? Otro oportunidad. So, bowing to public opinion, the host asks the question again. She thinks about it a little bit harder and she says, B. The crowd starts chanting, Otro oportunidad, otro oportunidad, otro oportunidad. So, the host once more gives her another chance, asks her the question. She thinks about it long and hard, and she sits there and she's sweating, and she says, finally, she says, see? And the audience goes, otro oportunidad, <laughs> otro oportunidad. <laughs> so I share the joke, not because it's particularly good or because I enjoy blonde jokes, but because in, in our house, otro oportunidad has become a thing, okay? Whenever we make a mistake, Whenever something doesn't go right the first time, whenever we leave the house and forget something and have to turn around and come back for it, that's what we say to one another. Otro oportunidad. There are times when you just need an otro oportunidad. Now the story we read today, although it may not sound like it at first, is a great example of what otro oportunidad looks like. For the past six weeks, we've been reading from the middle of Mark's gospel. Now, Mark's story, of course, is fundamentally about who Jesus is, and he's broken this story into two parts. The first half of the gospel is oriented around the question of Jesus' identity. Who is this guy? And that's something that we readers know from the very first verse, right? The very first thing we read is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But we spend eight chapters with bated breath, waiting for everybody else, including Jesus' disciples, to figure this out. So then, then we get to chapter 8. And we get the stories that we've just been reading, beginning with Peter's confession on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers confidently, you are the Messiah. Oh! Great, finally, somebody's got it. Now we're cooking, all right. But turns out it's not that simple. Because immediately after Peter finishes speaking, Jesus starts talking about his upcoming suffering and death in Jerusalem. And Peter rebukes Jesus. Jesus the Messiah, remember, for speaking about such things. In practically the same breath, Peter both proclaims Jesus as Messiah and demonstrates beyond the shadow of a doubt that he has no idea what that means. So interspersed among some other teachings, Jesus predicts his suffering and death three times in total in these three chapters, 8, 9, and 10. It's that rule of three. This is almost like a joke, right? It's a setup for a joke. And so if that's the joke, then today we get the punchline. You can see after the second prediction, the disciples bicker among themselves who is the greatest. 
After the third prediction, we get the story we heard last week where James and John presume to ask for seats of power in Jesus' kingdom, all the while demonstrating that they have no idea what to expect from Jesus. And so each time Jesus tells them that he's going to be humiliated and executed, the the disciples assume that he's talking in some sort of code or something, and they start thinking about the glory and the power that awaits them. So the rest of Mark's gospel is all about answering the second part of this question, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? So like I said, if this is all a setup for a joke, then today is the punchline. Because all of this happens sandwiched between two healing miracles. The first of which, I noticed, doesn't even show up in our lectionary, and the one today we don't always get because of when Easter falls, because sometimes this day falls on Reformation Sunday. So we don't even always get these stories. But they're both stories about Jesus healing blind people. The first occurs at Bethsaida, and the second that we hear today occurs at Jericho. At Bethsaida, a blind man is brought to Jesus by his friends who beg Jesus to heal him. And it's a really earthy healing. Jesus takes the man by the hand, he spits in his eyes, he lays his hands on him, and then the man says, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. So, Jesus lays his hands on the man a second time. The first touch, it seems, wasn't quite enough, right? Otro opportunidad. (laughs) So now in today's story, we have a blind man who seems to be half healed already because he's able to see something that all the sighted people can't, right? Jesus comes by, and the man somehow knows who he is, calling him by a messianic title, Son of David. Whereas the first man had to be brought to Jesus by others, the second one needed no help at all. In fact, he shouted out even when people were telling him to be quiet. And when he is summoned, he throws off his cloak and springs to his feet, apparently finding Jesus without any help. In contrast to the first healing, there's no hand-holding, no spit, no laying on of hands. Jesus doesn't even touch the guy. Just says, go, your faith has made you well. And he's off to the races. And so as I read these two stories together, it seems like St. Mark is setting us up to understand something. After living through the first half of the gospel narrative, the disciples and the others around Jesus are kind of like that first man. They can see Jesus is the Messiah, but they can't see clearly what that means. Their view of him is as distorted as the half-healed man who sees trees walking around. The stories about Peter's rebuke and the disciples' argument and James and John's request all make this abundantly clear, right? They're all waiting for that second touch, for that otra oportunidad to help them see more clearly. And in St. Mark's gospel, there's only one thing that can help them see that. All of Mark's story is oriented to what happens in Jerusalem. The thing that's coming up that Jesus has just told us about three times in a row. That's what Jesus has been patiently telling these half-blind disciples for the last month and a half. The Son of Man will be handed over to the religious authorities, the very people who represent the God who sent him, and he will be beaten and mocked and killed by them. And on the third day, he will rise again. Now, it's telling that throughout Mark's gospel, whenever Jesus does something miraculous, or whenever someone recognizes who he is, he always tells them to keep quiet. Right? Did you ever notice that? He's always telling people, don't say anything. It happens all the time at exorcisms, at healings, at the transfiguration all the way up to the cross. After Jesus dies, a Roman centurion, a Gentile, reminder, remind you, a soldier of the occupying forces, looks up and says, surely this man was God's son. 
and there's nobody there to tell him to be quiet. Hmm. Finally, we see what it means to be God's son. It's not about glory. It's not about power. It's not even about good fortune. It's about a love that is limitless, a love that loves to the end, that gives of itself completely. I wonder if St. Mark is trying in these stories to help us learn something about ourselves. As disciples of Jesus, it can be tempting to think that we've got this whole Jesus thing figured out, right? Especially those of us who've been following for many decades. We know what to do. We show up on Sundays, we be nice to people, we read the Bible, and we hope for that reward that's waiting for us, right? But what if that's not the whole story? What if the way that we see the world, the way that we see our own faith, is as distorted as seeing trees walking around? Or maybe Mark is help, trying to help us see something new about God right? It's easy to see God in the good things, things like healings and deeds of power and miracles. Like Peter and James and John, we want to stay on the Transfiguration Mountain, basking in God's glory, telling about all the wonderful things that God has done for us, right? And healing and helping and curing and uplifting. But sometimes life is in mountaintops. Sometimes it's valleys. Sometimes it's stress and anxiety. Sometimes it's pandemic. Sometimes it's cancer and warfare and racism. Anyone can see God in the light, but what about in the darkness? How do we find God when our eyes are blinded to them? I wonder if we might be like Peter and James and John and everyone else waiting for that second touch, for that otra oportunidad. I wonder if maybe we don't see as clearly as we think we do all the time. And that's saying something because I know a lot of us wonder sometimes if we can see it at all, right? But even in our blindness, there's still hope that we might see. Bartimaeus couldn't see any more than the man in Bethsaida, but he called out to Jesus on his own, sprang up and ran right to him. Bartimaeus couldn't see, but he could somehow see God at work in Jesus, the son of David. Perhaps the most striking difference between these two blindness stories is how they end. The man from Bethsaida went back home after having his sight restored. Okay, good, fine, that's what Jesus told him to do. But the man from Jericho, the son of Timaeus, followed Jesus on the way. Now in the Gospels, on the way is a meaningful phrase. St. Luke tells us in Acts that before they were called Christians, Jesus' early disciples simply called themselves the way. When Bartimaeus follows Jesus on the way, He's following him on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to the cross and the tomb, on the way to the resurrection. In other words, he's following him on the way to the rest of the story and beyond. He's following him on the way to the otra oportunidad. It also bears mentioning that when the man follows him, He's putting himself right where Jesus told Peter to get, behind me, following me. I wonder if this story is asking us if we also are willing to get behind Jesus and follow him on the way to our own otra oportunidad, to keep following, to keep looking, to keep searching for God in the places where God seems not to be found. Because the real question, the $64,000 question, is this. How do we see God when God is nowhere to be seen? Can we look at pandemic, at hatred and division, at a total disruption of our daily routines and see God at work somehow? 
Can we see God at work outside the church? Can we see Jesus in the faces of people who do not call themselves Christian? Can we look at the painful and horrific devices of Roman torture and oppression and see God? Maybe we can't, and that's okay. Most people can't. But I think that's why St. Mark tells us the story, to give us hope for an otra oportunidad. That's why he wants to show us Jesus, not just Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration or Jesus seated at the right hand of the God in glory, but Jesus headed to Jerusalem to give his life as a ransom for many. Only following Jesus on the way and living the rest of that story with him and experiencing that love that only he can give can cure our blindness and show us God in things like this.